Hey class, Professor Deborah Oakley here. I'm going to be doing a couple of examples on beam reactions. I'll be doing this both by analytic means using the principle of rotational equilibrium as well as linear equilibrium using graphics, which also shows uh, rotational equilibrium as well. So uh, without further ado, let's get to it. So to begin with, let's start with the very most basic example. We'll just do a simple beam with a single concentrated load at the center. Now we'll draw this with our typical support indicators. We'll use a pin on the left hand side and a roller on the right hand side, meaning that the pin has the capability of resisting both a vertical component to the left hand reaction as well as a horizontal component, which in many cases is zero because there's no vertical load. Only the right hand side is capable of resisting a vertical load normal to the surface because this is a roller. Any horizontal forces would cause that to translate. So this is our hypothetical span or surface or something that this is on. And then we diagram a load onto this. We'll say this is a 10,000 pound load, 10 kips. And then to complete the free body diagram, we need a distance. We'll just call this 10 feet. So any free body diagram of a beam structure has to include both the support reactions on either side, the applied loads, as well as the length and the distances to any of the loads. So in this case, our load here is going to be at 5 feet. Now this is a trivial example because the load is exactly in the middle. We can tell by inspection, as we say, that half of that load is going to go to the right side, half of the go load is going to go to the left side. So that comes out to 5 kips and 5 kips. There's really not a need to do any calculation on that because that is such a basic calculation. But I do want to use this to introduce the graphic technique. So the graphic technique works similar to when we find the resultant of forces uh, that are parallel. So we're going to introduce some nomenclature here that we'll be using later. And that is that we identify the spaces between the uh, loads and actions, loads and reactions on the structure. And so we have an A here, that's the space here. Now there's no horizontally acting load, so this actually is zero. So we'll take that out for right now, just for simplicity. So we have a region between this reaction here and this load, that's A. A region between this load and this reaction here, we'll call this B. So A is this entire area here. B is this area right here. And then C is the space in between these two reactions. This is a nomenclature that we will get used to when we do a lot of stuff with cables and trusses. Now, this works with a diagram. So this is what we call, it's the free body diagram. We call it a form diagram. And we work this in conjunction with our force polygon, which itself is drawn to a specific scale. So we're going to have a graphic over on the right hand side here that represents the forces. So we have a downward force of 10 kips. And let's use a scale such that um, <coughs> one square equals one kip here. So that's a one tenth scale. Is that no 20, 20, I think 20. No, we need 50. Correct myself yet again, 50. So this is um, one, one uh, square here. This is a, um, a 20th of an inch square, 10th of an inch square, fifth, matter, fifth of an inch. Um, <coughs> I don't know how long this is. Is it a quarter inch? fifth of an inch, fifth of an inch, it's an inch divided by five. So 
50. That means we have 0 through 10. So this becomes point A, this comes point B. And the distance between A and B is 10 kips. This is the length of this vector when we do this in a scale. 1 inch equals 5 kips. So we get that from a 1 to 50 scale. Now, the vector AB is getting shared by the left and right hand sides. And this is a technique that we'll use uh, with cables, but it also works with beams. So I'm just going to pick any random point here and draw lines to that point from points A and B. And these lines are going to get transferred to the line of action of all of these forces. So in this case, all the forces are vertical. So the line of action is vertical. So I will use my rolling ruler to transfer this line starting over at the left hand side until it intersects with the 10 kip force and then I go down transfer that line from this point down to this line of action right here now the line that closes this we refer to this as the closing string And that will become more clear when we do arches and cables with this technique. But the key thing is this closing string, when I transfer it back to this point, will divide the left and right reactions in two. So if this has worked, I should have five kips here and five kips here. And boom, there we go. It divides it exactly in half. And the interesting thing here is that no matter where I choose a point, Let's choose, let's say out here. This is going to give a shape in the opposite direction. I'm going to take that line, transfer it over to this line of action. So I'm computing, creating a new graphic here. Then I take this line, transfer it to this line of action, which comes out to the middle here draw a line that goes between them, get almost identical closing strings, and boom, lands right there. Try another spot, how about right down here? So we'll create an entirely new graphic. This one also will be pointing up. So this one's really steep. We'll start it down here. Go all the way up until it crosses that line, which happens right about there. Then we transfer this one over to here. So now our closing string looks like this. Transfer that closing string up, and yet again, it has come to exactly the same spot in the middle, dividing this into five kips and five kips. This is point C, the space in between the left and the right reaction. So now the power of this is that it lets us very quickly visualize what happens to a beam when it changes the magnitude of the force. So let's take a look at the same diagram, but we're going to move the location of the force. All right, so what happens if we have a load that is not symmetric, not, not on the center of the structure?
Now I've redrawn this to an actual scale. I'm using the 1 to 30 scale and scaling this to uh, 10 feet because I want to be accurate about where the position of this is. I can't just simply divide it in half like I did with the first one because this needs to be an accurate percentage of the total. What scale you use depends on the magnitude of the sizes that you work with. Uh, any, any scale is possible. So the procedure though is exactly the same. We're going to take this region around here and we're going to label this A. This region around here we're going to label this B and then the space between the two reactions we'll call that C. This is simply a way of identifying the forces. So I'm going to do the same process that we did last time. I'm going to use a scale of 1 inches 5 kips. Put that one aside. So that's our 50 scale here, and we will go down by a magnitude of 10 kips. So we have exactly the same load. And it starts at point A and goes to point B. The reason that it's A to B is because we label this load by the letter on either side of it. So it's A on the left, B on the right. That means we start at A and end at B. What we're looking for is point C, which now will not be in the center because the 10 kip load is not in the center. And a grade schooler would know that if we put most of the load to the right hand side, then there should be a larger reaction on the right hand side. So let's check that out graphically. Again, we can pick any arbitrary point and create our diagram. So we start with these lines, they're called rays, so this is the force polygon. Again, scale. One inch is five kips, or a one to fifty scale. Line of action of these forces on the left and right are over here and the load itself is here. Those lines will intersect with this graphic. So we simply transfer these lines over, and this time we're going to be going down, because I drew it on the right-hand side. So here's the intersection with the line on the load, and follow the other one up. From the start point of the first line to the end point of the second line, we join that. We'll just do that in red so it shows up better. This is the closing string. I'm going to take that closing string then and transfer it over to this diagram. It intersects here. This is point C. Now we can simply measure off this diagram that we have 8 kips on the right hand side and then the balance is the 2 kips right here. We can see that with the, the squares. And very quickly you could see that if I were to position the load perhaps over here Why don't we just do that? So this looks all the same. I have A to B is 10 kips. Well, this is still 10 kips. What's changed is its position. So I can still use this graphic, and I can still use these lines, but now they're going to intersect over here. And then the second line comes over here and intersects up here. And we get a closing string at this angle, bring that closing string down, and we can see that point C is down here now, and that magnitude is only 3 kips, 1, 2, 3. So we've gone down from 8 kips, so B to C is the name of this force. We go B to C, 1, 2, 3.
So that would be three kips over here. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the right hand side when we shift the load over towards the left. So we see it right in the graphic. So the graphics are a way for us to visualize how the impact of changing a load is. Now let's do this with rotational equilibrium. So in order to rotational equilibrium we have to recognize that we have to eliminate one of the unknowns. So if I choose a moment center that is on the left hand side, so that is we're looking right here. That's going to be where everything rotates about. We use the original position of 10 kips and it's 8 feet away so its moment arm looks like this. Then I have a reaction on the right hand side that's unknown but I do know the distance, which is 10 kips. I mean 10 feet, rather. So we can see clearly that relative to this point, this load has a tendency to rotate in a clockwise direction. This load has a tendency to rotate counterclockwise, or this reaction, I should say. So we simply write an equation for that moment. We call this L for left-hand side. Moments about L equals zero, sum those moments. We'll call clockwise positive. That's the equation that we are writing out. So we want to put all the terms of the equation. That means I've got 10 kips at 8 feet going in a clockwise direction. I've called clockwise positive, so this is positive. Then the RB vertical its moment arm is 10 feet. It has to be negative because I'm going opposite to my sine direction here. That's all that's rotating about point L, so that has to all equal to zero. So RB vertical is 80 kip feet divided by 10 feet. Feet are going to cancel. RB vertical is 8 kips. or I changed that to a B, that's R, it was actually an R, I didn't copy that right, R, R. We use different letters, sometimes A on the left, B on the right, L for left, R for right, it, it varies. So then we find out the last reaction, the A-kips, is simply taking the balance by some of the forces vertically equal to zero. So negative 10 kips because it's going downward plus r left plus r right equals zero. We've already calculated r right is eight kips, so r left is ten kips minus eight kips or two kips. So that confirms the graphics that we did previously.